We have made it halfway through Season 2 of the San Francisco Giants franchise here on MLB The Show 24. As today, we're going to make it up to the All-Star break, which of course includes the MLB Draft. And today we'll be going through our final little bit of scouting. As it stands now, we're 44-40, and 40, coming off a pretty shaky month of June. Certainly was not as good as the first two months of the year. And we saw a lot of ups and downs and inconsistencies. Our remaining four series until the break find us on the road against the Rockies and the Dodgers, and then at home against the Nationals and the Rays. Of course, as I mentioned, we're right at the MLB Draft, which will be in the next episode, premiering either Saturday or Sunday. I have not officially picked the date or the time yet, but I'll let you guys know once we get closer. And today we'll be going over position players in this year's class, but that'll of course be later in the episode. Currently at 44 and 40, we're in third place in the division and the second team out of the wild card, but it is very tight. We're only a game out, but there's a number of teams also right on our tail behind us, so we don't have a lot of breathing room. As we get closer to the All-Star break, we've got a number of guys who I feel like have a chance of making it. Jung Hu Lee is on pace to win the batting title again. JP Crawford has had a great year for us at short. Even Jorge Soler at 22 home runs has played really well over the last month or so, finally looking worth the big contract. Pitching-wise, obviously it's been Blake Snell leading the way for us, and we've got some youngsters now really getting big roles for us pitching-wise with the injury to Kyle Harrison, who of course fractured his hand a couple episodes ago, moving him to the 60-day IL, which is where Carson Wisenhunt has taken his place and so far through three starts. Wizen Hunt has been really good. Keaton Wynn should be coming back fairly soon, and once he does, we're going to have a decision on what we want to do with Wizen Hunt. As for all-star voting, John Hu Lee is currently second for center field. He really should be first. J.P. Crawford is at third for shortstop. Camilo Duvall is currently fifth amongst closers, even though he's had an up-and-down season. And then Blake Snell is fifth amongst starting pitchers. Usually five is the cutoff, so Snell is right on the fringe. But keep in mind, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, who was in first, tore his rotator cuff, so he will not be an all-star. And obviously, that's a big deal because the Dodgers, who are the best team in our division, lost arguably the best pitcher in the National League. Speaking of the Dodgers, I want to play against them, so we'll simulate here through these three games at Coors Field against the Colorado Rockies. Our offense has performed well so far this year at Coors. We'll see if we can keep it going. And for what it's worth, in the first game, we're facing off against a rookie in Michael Daryl Hicks, who's making his Major League debut. So hopefully the offense can make his life not fun. So we're going to hop into this first game, and sure enough, we are leading it 4-0. The offense has been pretty solid, while Robbie Ray and the pitching staff have thrown a shutout. Tyro Estrada's had a great game. He's 3-for-3, three three, triple shy of the cycle. First pitch from Lawrence, and this actually is a chance to do it. In the right field corner, Estrada's going to be thinking three for sure, moving as fast as he can. The throw to third, it's going to be close, and it is in time. No cycle for Tyro Estrada. He does bring in a run, though, but a good play there and right by Nolan Jones. If there wasn't a superhuman athlete there in the outfield, I think there's a chance Estrada would have hit for the cycle. Nonetheless, the Giants win the game 5-0, but it's not all fun in games. Robbie Ray broke his hand, and he'll be out for two to three months and is going to the 60-day injured list. For most teams, they deal with their pitchers having elbow injuries. For us, it's hand injuries. So we ended up pitching a shutout despite the fact that Robbie Ray got injured. Ray only went four and a third, and he only allowed one hit before being taken out of the game. I don't know what the difference here is between Robbie Ray's broken hand and Kyle Harrison's fractured hand. A break and a fracture is pretty much the same thing. And it certainly means the same thing for us because both of them are on the 60-day injured list and Robbie Ray is not going to be back until September. So just like that, there's two pitchers in the rotation who we now have to replace. It's been an up-and-down season for Robbie Ray, but overall he's been pretty solid. Don't let the 2-8 and eight record fool you. He's been pretty good despite missing pretty much the last two seasons due to Tommy John surgery. Now, Keaton Wynn is very close to coming back. He's only four days away, so he will most likely take that spot in the rotation as we expected. But I'm going to want to give him a start or two in AAA just to make sure he's on his A game. So for the time being, 
We're going to need somebody who can replace Robbie Ray's spot in the rotation until the All-Star break, which is likely two starts. So I think that's going to be Forrest Whitley. There aren't really many better options in the minors, and I'm willing to give Whitley a shot. Ethan Small is going to replace Whitley in the bullpen as the lawn reliever. Whitley is going to slide in the rotation. And this means that Carson Wisenhunt will probably stay in the rotation for the foreseeable future. The decision has been made for us, and since there's two pitchers on the injured list, he's going to stick around on the big league roster while Forrest Whitley gets a couple starts and then will likely be replaced by Keaton Wynn, assuming Keaton Wynn pitches well enough in his rehab starts. Whitley was called up earlier in the season. He's pitched in 18 games out of the bullpen. The ERA is not great at 4.67, but the whip is barely at 1.1. He's not allowing base runners, and I think his numbers are better than the ERA suggests. Again, though, I think the biggest thing with this injury is that bearing another injury or some unforeseen struggles, Carson Wisenhunt's going to stay in the rotation. So we end up taking 2-3 or three against Colorado, splitting the final two games. Blake Snell had another really strong start. He has moved up to third in terms of starting pitcher voting, technically second if you don't count Yamamoto. As for Jorge Soler, his hot streak has continued. He homered in all three games against Colorado. The OPS moved up around 70 points in those three games alone, and his war is positive for the first time in a while. His 25 home runs are tied for second in the NL, only behind Pete Alonso, who has comfortably been the best hitter in baseball. It is worth noting that Soler is second for RBIs, while J.P. Crawford is currently in fifth. Good to see our guys driving in some runs, but they can't hold a candle to what Pete Alonso is doing. So I want to pitch with Forrest Whitley, his first big league start. That's this last game against the Dodgers. Keaton Wynn officially activated off the 60-day IL. He'll make two starts in AAA Sacramento, and we'll see how it goes before calling him back up as we lose the first two games against the Dodgers. Carson Wisenhunt with another so-so start. It's been a mixed bag for Wisenhunt. I think we're going to see the good and the bad from him, but now the expectations are going to be a lot higher for him, being that we thought he was only going to be up for a few starts, and now he might be up for the remainder of this season, if not close to. So let's hop into this third and final game here at Dodger Stadium. The Dodgers looking to sweep San Francisco, who now sits at a record of 46-43. and 43. This will be the last meeting between these two teams until the final regular season series of the year. I'm curious to see if that's an important one for San Francisco, where they may need to win some games to make the playoffs. There's a look at your lineups, and there's a look at Walker Bueller. Bueller? Bueller? Yes, Bueller. It's been an interesting season for Walker Bueller, who started in the bullpen, coming back from Tommy John surgery, where he missed two consecutive seasons. But he has come now to the rotation, and he's been pretty good. ERA below three, whip barely above one. He has made a seamless transition back into the rotation for the Dodgers as he strikes out J.P. Crawford on the cutter. Jorge Soler now up for San Francisco, looking to continue his hot streak. Checks his swing. Didn't go around, but it doesn't matter. It was a strike anyway. And with that, we'll take a look at Forrest Whitley making his first big league start. He's going to be playing against the B team, though, for the Dodgers. Mookie Betts is hurt. Freddie Freeman is getting the day off. We will get to see Shohei Otani, but he's the only one of the big three who is starting today. Otani with two away, rips it into the gap. Soler cannot make the play as this one will roll to the wall. A two-out extra base hit for Shohei Otani as he holds up at second with a double. And we'll see if the Dodgers can look to drive him in and score first as Otani waves to the crowd. It's Max Muncy who's ahead 3-1, and he takes a walk. Muncy is some of the better plate discipline in all of baseball, showing it there. And that'll bring up the Fresh Prince. Will Smith up the middle. Crawford makes the play. Throw to first is in time. Good defense there by J.P. Crawford, potentially saving a run from being scored as we move into the second with no score. San Francisco is still looking for their first base runner. We'll see if they can get it here. Blake Sable, the catcher up with a full count, two away. Lines this one nicely into left. It's got some carry, but it will be caught. Back-to-back, -back, one, two, three innings to start the game for Walker Bueller, as that'll bring us to the bottom of the second. Adam Frazier's had a remarkable season. Double-digit home runs, OPS above 900, but he chases the curveball. First strike out of the game for Forrest Whitley, and here's his second against the former giant, Michael Conforto. Again, it's the curveball for Forrest. 
And with that, we are through two. Both pitchers looking good so far as we travel into the third. Joey Gallo is up with one away. Gallo looking to be the first base runner of the day here for San Francisco, but he's behind one and two. And Gallo crushes it, but it is foul. Gallo got a piece of it, but swung too early. And with him being behind in the count and his four plate vision, it sucks that he missed out on the home run. But he'll make up for it on the very next pitch. Times it up and crushes it into right. No doubt about that one as the Giants score first. They lead it 1-0. Joey Gallo with his 12th home run of the season going 432 feet. An absolute behemoth of the piss missile from Joey Gallo. And so the Giants are on the board first as Miguel Rojas strikes out. Good pitch by Whitley. We'll see if he can get through the rest of the inning, and he does. The former Giant, Mauricio Dubon, goes down on the curveball. That curve has been filthy today from Forrest Whitley as we move into the fourth. San Fran leads 1-0. Full count for Jorge Soler. He draws a walk. I wouldn't want to pitch to Soler in this hot streak either, so I don't blame Bueller for keeping it out of the strike zone. Two away now for Jonathan India. He's behind one and two. Grounds it up the middle. It's deflected at third. The throw to first is not in time. An infield single for Jonathan India. Two on, two away for Blake Sable, who lines this one in to left. The runner, Soler, looks to score. India to third. Both runners are safe. An RBI single for Blake Sable, and the Giants lead it two to nothing. Sable, one of the best clutch hitters on the roster. Making a play there to bring in another run. That'll bring you Tyro Estrada. He's behind one and two, and he lines it in the left. But Chris Taylor will track it down. San Francisco adds another one here with the RBI single by Blake Sable as we go bottom four. Max Muncy with a liner in the right. At the track, at the wall, it is gone. Solo home run for Muncy. That is his 20th of the year, and the Dodgers are on the board as it's 2-1. to one. So they get that run right back as it's Muncy who puts them on the board. Will Smith now, grounder to short. Going to be a tough play. Backhanded throw. In time! Another nice play at short by J.P. Crawford for the second out of the inning. We'll see if Whitley can make it through here against Adam Frazier. This one is high and deep and a right. Kepler at the track, at the wall. It is gone! A close one there as Kepler tries to scale it up like Spider-Man. But that ball is able to get out. Adam Frazier with his 13th home run of the year. I told you he was producing. And the Dodgers tie it up at two. A pair of homers here in the bottom of the fourth for L.A. They're going to look to keep the offense going here. It's Chris Taylor. Bloops it into left. But hey, a hit is a hit. He's going to make it over to second. Good throw by Soler, but it's not in time. It's not every day you find a ball goes 66 off the bat that ends up as an extra base hit. Conforto looks to bring him in, but that's a wild pitch. Throw to third. He is not in time. I think Sable picked it up a little slower to try to bait Taylor into running, but it backfires, although I don't think it would have really mattered because this ball goes over Soler's head. An RBI double for the former giant, Michael Conforto, and it's now 3-2. to two. Forrest Whitley looks so good through the first three innings. And now he has completely fallen apart. Trey Sweeney, the 3-2. Sweeney to miss on the fastball. And that'll probably do it for Forrest Whitley. Certainly didn't think that would be it for him going into the inning. But a rough one as he allows a pair of homers and an RBI double. The Dodgers lead it as Joey Gallo leads off the fifth with a walk. Just got to stack base runners just as the Giants did in the fourth, which ultimately resulted in runs. Marco Luciano swings and misses at the slider. Luciano playing as a DH today, getting some rest defensively with a big workload over the last week or so. Jung Hu Lee chases the knuckle curve. What a pitch by Bueller. And a quiet start for Lee. He's 0 for 3. Hey, that rhymed. JP Crawford now hits it up the middle. Nice play. It's short by Sweeney. He flips it over to second. And the Dodgers get through the fifth. Another strong inning from Walker Bueller. As we go to the bottom of the fifth, take a look at Tristan Beck who's going to come out of the bullpen here for the Giants. He's only thrown 13 and two-thirds innings this year. I'm not really sure why he's gotten such a lack of workload, but he's been all right, 3.95 ERA, pretty much what you would expect out of him. And he'll start with the top of the order. 
Miguel Rojas up the middle. Beck snags it away. Great defense on the mound by Tristan Beck for the first out of the inning. That'll bring up Mauricio Dubon, who won a gold glove a couple of years ago with the Astros after being sent away from San Francisco. And he goes down looking. Nice pitch by Beck as we go into the sixth. Daniel Hudson, the veteran righty, comes out of the bullpen for the Dodgers, making his only third appearance of the year. He's allowed one run in three innings so far. Solaire starts things off. He chases the circle change. Great pitch there by Hudson to completely fool him out of the zone. Max Kepler now up here for the Giants. He's been quiet so far today, 0 for 2, but he's ahead 3-1. Gets a pitch to hit and sends it into the opposite field. Playing the shift proves to backfire for the Giants. They probably would have gotten an out otherwise or at the worst would have allowed a single. But instead it's a double for Max Kepler who's in scoring position. We'll see if San Francisco can bring him in as that will send up Jonathan India who reached base off of an infield single in his last at bat and he will draw a walk. Another base runner here for the Giants. Two on for Blake Sable who drove in a run his last at bat. Count is full, rips it into left for a hit. Kepler's going to hold up at third. That proves to be a good decision. He would have been out by a mile. And, uh, oh, God, the bases are loaded. Tyro, I beg of you, do not put the ball on the ground. He put the ball on the ground. The Dodgers can turn two, and they do, inning over. That might be the least surprising outcome I have seen all day. A double play with the bases loaded to wrap up the inning where nobody scores, and the Dodgers hold on to their lead, and they're going to look to add to it. Muncy into right center. That one is gone. His second home run in the ball game in his 21st of the year. A big game for Muncy. He walked and is now homered twice. And the Dodgers now lead 4-2. Beck will stay in the game as Will Smith splits that run right between his legs for a single into center. I'm not so sure Beck is going to stick around much longer after that. And he will be taken out for the lefty Taylor Rogers. While his twin brother, Tyler Rogers, hasn't pitched so well over the last month or so, Taylor has continued his excellent season with an ERA at around 1.6. Lefty on lefty crime against Adam Frazier, who homered in his last at bat, and he goes down looking on the slurve. Very nice pitch by Rogers. Chris Taylor now behind 1-2. Gets that one by the diving glove of Gallo. The Giants could have made the play had the infield not played in. But it goes for a base hit, and the Dodgers get two aboard here. Both runners would advance. They're now in scoring position. Two away for Sweeney. Got him on the cutter! He was completely bamboozled by the outside pitch from Rodgers, who gets out of the inning. It's 4-2, to two, and we move into the seventh. Chris Martin will come in for the Dodgers. 1.74 ERA this year. He's been very good. Facing off against Joey Gallo, who's reached base in each of his first two at-bats. Looks to do so again. But not so fast, buddy. Miguel Rojas has other plans at second base. What a play. That'll bring up Marco Luciano. He sends that one into right for a hit. And the Giants get a man on with one away and the potential tying run up. It's the top of the order. Jun Hu Lee's been quiet today. 0 for 3. Looking to change that. As that one is over the glove of Mutsi. Into right. Looking for extra bases. And that will be a double. As Luciano's headed home, and he will be safe. It's 4-3. Jun Hu Lee had a near 20-game hit streak snapped in the first game of the Colorado series a few days ago, but he's looking to get back into the swing of things as J.P. Crawford ignites this one into right field. He places the bat down as that one is gone, and the Giants take the lead. It's 5-4. Nobody on this team has hit better with runners on base than J.P. Crawford, who's hit over 400 with runners in scoring position. That's his 13th home run of the year, passing his home run total from last year at 12. And it's fitting because Jun Hu Lee, who hit 12 home runs last year, has also just passed his total within the past few games. So Chris Martin is yanked. He'll be replaced by Phil Maton, who strikes out Jorge Soler on the slurve. We'll see if he can get out of the inning now here against Max Kepler. And he gets a piece of this one. High and deep in his center. Back at the track. At the wall. It is caught. Still a very good inning for the Giants. They get an RBI double from Jun Hu Lee. And a two-run homer to take the lead by J.P. Crawford. Into the bottom of the seventh now. Jose Leclerc 
is out of the bullpen for the Giants here against Mauricio Dubon, who singles into center. So with one away, the Giants allow a base runner. And guess who's next up for the Dodgers? It is Shohei Otani, one for three so far. And he puts that one up the middle for another hit. Dubon will look to make it to third. The throw from Lee is offline. And now the Dodgers are making things interesting again. They've got runners on the corners looking to do some damage. And it's Max Muncy, who's homered in his last two at-bats. Strikes out on the slider. Big pitch by Jose LeClerc. Muncy frustrated with himself as Will Smith swings out of his shoes on the inside fastball. Another great pitch by LeClerc as it remains 5-4 and we move into the eighth. Evan Phillips is into the game here for the Dodgers. Their former closer, now setup man, will look to set the Dodgers' offense up for a comeback. With two away, Estrada lines it into right, and it will be a 1-2-3 inning. As we go to the bottom of the eighth, and the Giants are going to do something sort of unconventional here. Shohei Otani is the seventh batter up. So theoretically, if we get through the eighth and the ninth untouched, we won't have to see him. Because of that... Camilo Duvall is coming in the game earlier than expected. It's not a save situation yet as he strikes out Adam Frazier on the slider. Here's Freddie Freeman, pinch hitter off the bench. With a grounder to second, Estrada makes the play, and Camilo Duvall gets through the eighth. The question is, will he stay for the ninth, and how much gas will he have in the tank? Let's move into the top of the ninth now, as it will be another pitching change here for the Dodgers. The lefty, Alex Vesia, comes into the game. He's had a disappointing season with an ERA at 5.63 as he will start things off with one away against Marco Luciano who strikes out on the fastball. Good pitch by Vesia, 96 up and away. Two gone now that brings us to the top of the order. Jun Hu Lee drove in a run and scored in his last at bat as he draws a walk. Good at bat for Lee. He is aboard now for J.P. Crawford who homered in his last at bat. One of the biggest plays of the game as that one gets by the glove of Rojas for a base hit into right. San Francisco's looking for a little two-out rally. They've got two on, two away, and it's the hot hand. Jorge Soler looking to make another big play and put an exclamation point on this one. A three-run blast for Jorge Soler. And the Giants are all of a sudden up by four as it's eight to four. We get some more Soler power. His 26th home run of the year. What a month and a half for Jorge Soler as the Dodgers make another pitching change. Bruce Dark Gratterall is going to come in the game. He'll face off against Max Kepler, looking to keep the lead at four with no further damage done. And Kepler does go down looking. So I had the idea of having Camilo Duvall pitch, assuming we weren't going to get three runs in the top of the ninth inning. But this is certainly a pleasant revelation. We're going to keep Duvall in, but we're not going to pressure him to go the entire way. Now the Dodgers were down to their final strike there, but Mauricio Dubon singles into right. So my whole master plan of not facing off against Shohei Otani almost worked, but it didn't. Otani grounds it to second. Estrada makes the play. Throw to first. In time, it's over. So our master plan didn't quite work as we expected, but we won the game. That's all that matters. 8-4, to four, your final. The offense started slow, but they picked it up late. In the seventh, we scored three Headline by the home run by J.P. Crawford. And then in the ninth, with the icing on the cake, a three-run shot by Jorge Soler to clinch it as we ultimately avoid the sweep. Now, I do have a secret real quick. So my reasoning for bringing in Camilo Duvall in the eighth inning was actually a lie. I originally put A.J. Minter in the game, and afterwards, I was supposed to warm up Camilo Duvall for the ninth. The problem is I accidentally clicked for Duvall to come into the game. So I had to make something up for us to sound smart. And had we lost this game, I probably would have never told you guys what had ended up happening. But since we won, I can I can say it without feeling stupid. So with that, we're going to simulate this four-game set against Washington. And we're only going to get through the first game against Tampa Bay, just so I don't simulate past the draft. So we ended up getting some good news. Keaton Wynn, who was just activated off the injured list, is no longer hurt. He'll be scheduled to pitch again two games in Sacramento. We'll see how he does, and we'll make a decision from there. So let's hop into this matchup here against the Nationals. We're up 3-2 to two in the bottom of the eighth. 
Jonathan India needs a double for the cycle, and it is a pretty big spot here with two runners on and two away. A chance to add some insurance for Camilo Duvall, and it's not going to happen as he strikes out. Good pitch by Hunter Harvey. But luckily, Camilo Duvall would shut the door for his 22nd save of the season as the Giants end up winning it by the final score of 3-2. to two. So a good win here in Game 1 of 4 against the Nationals as we look to start a little win streak. We then would get offered a trade here from the Baltimore Orioles, and um, the trade offer ended up being pretty bad. Actually, I lied. It ended up being really bad. So they're offering us Jorge Mateo, who's a below-average Major League shortstop, for Scott Rios, the number one prospect in all of baseball. Tempting offer, I know. But um, I think we're ultimately going to pass on this one. Scott Rios is somebody who I think could be a Cy Young one day, while Jorge Mateo can barely get his war above zero. Let's hop into this game here against the Nationals. We're trailing 3-2. Jun Hu Lee is up with two away here in the ninth with the runner on as it's a dribbler to third. Throw over to second is in time, and the Nationals end up winning this one 3-2. to two. Ultimately, we'd split the four games against Washington, and that brings us here to game one against Tampa Bay. Look at the score. 13 runs, 21 hits. We've scored in every inning since the third. Max Kepler is a triple shy of the cycle as the Giants look to add some more runs. And it won't be from Kepler. The first time all day he has been retired as he strikes out on the fastball from Colin Poche. Yandy Diaz would single in the ninth. A huge single to cut the lead all the way to six as San Francisco wins it by the score of 13-7. In this game, though, Austin Slater hurt his hip. He'll be out for one to two weeks. And Luis Toribio will be called up in his place. Toribio through the first month of the year was abysmal, but he's really picked it up in AAA. The numbers aren't spectacular, and his war is almost negative one, but don't get it twisted. He's been playing well since the start of May, and I am confident in him joining the big league team, getting some considerable playing time. So as you guys know, we went 3-2 and two over the five games. We simulated splitting against Washington and then beating the Tampa Bay Rays. The hot streak for Jorge Soler would continue as he homered in the third game. He also homered in the fourth game. And we had a lot of guys homer in this game against Tampa Bay. Only two starters did not end up with a base hit. One of them, oddly enough, was John Hu Lee, who went 0 for 3 before getting hurt with a minor knee injury. He's fine, but he was replaced by Austin Slater, who got a hit and then also got hurt. So I guess the center field spot was just cursed. So Lair replaced him and reached base twice. So the center fielders reached base on all three plate appearances after Lee was taken out of the game, which is ironic because, well, Jun Hu Lee lives on base. This was Forrest Whitley's second start. He didn't pitch very well, allowing six runs in five innings. But it didn't matter because the offense had one of their best games of the entire season. 21 hits is wild. So that puts us at 50 and 45 with two games to go before the All-Star break. Again, I don't want to simulate past them because I don't want to accidentally jump the draft. We're still in third in the division. It is worth noting that the Diamondbacks have actually passed the Dodgers in first place. And before we wrap things up, we're going to do our final set of prospect profiles as we go over some of the notable position players in this year's class. Last episode, we talked about the pitchers. Today, we're going to go through the position players. And as I've mentioned throughout our previous looks at the draft class so far, I think this class, in terms of its talent, is special. It's loaded at the top, and there's so much depth. Every team's going to have an opportunity to add some game changers to their farm system. Of course, we had the fourth overall pick and are probably picking a position player. We've already run down some of the absolute top prospects, but I do want to go over them again because, well, this is kind of a really big decision for us. So this is a three-player draft at the top with Jeremy Franco, Tommy Rogers, and Caleb Mitchell. If this was, say, the NBA draft, these guys would go in the top three. We would not have a chance in any of them. But in baseball, it's a little bit different because players ask for certain bonus demands. And these guys are asking for record-breaking money, and understandably so, because they're all number one overall pick caliber players. So because of that, somebody picking at the top may not want to shell all that money into one prospect, and instead they may look for somebody cheaper. So there's a real chance we could get one of these guys on the board at pick four, although the question is, if one of these guys do fall... Are we going to want to spend the bonus money on them and possibly jeopardize the rest of our draft? 
it would be a major risk. And because of that, I have done my full homework on these three prospects. We'll start with Jeremy Franco, who has the most untraditional story of the group. He is currently playing at a JUCO in Kentucky. Maybe not necessarily the spot you think of for a top prospect, but he has been the best player in JUCO ball this year. He is a dominant offensive player. He hits for good contact. He hits for good power. Now, the rest of this game isn't very well-rounded. He's not some great defensive player. There's a reason why he's stuck at first. He's not some great athlete. He's not the fastest. But the guy hits the ball. And here at the top of the draft, we're looking for game changers on offense. Tommy Rogers, I think, has the highest ceiling of these top three players and honestly has the highest ceiling of any high school prospect since probably Bryce Harper nearly 15 years ago. Tommy Rogers has an interesting build. He's 5'7", around 165 pounds. He's like the Mighty Mouse on that field, and doctors say there's a chance he could grow a few more inches. Despite his lack of size, he has got incredible strength and incredible power. He's got great pop off the bat, good contact, good plate skills. The most exciting area of his game, though, is his speed. He's the fastest player in the draft and will likely be the fastest player in Major League Baseball once he gets called up to the big leagues. I think the ceiling with this kid is sky high. There's a reason why his bonus demand is so much money, though. If theoretically we were to pick him and sign him, we would have barely enough money for everybody else. Is it worth it to put all of that into one player? I'm not really sure. And then there's Caleb Mitchell, who I think is the safest of the group. The Syracuse third baseman hits from both sides of the plate and is very effective both ways, but he's especially good facing off against right-handers. Mitchell's got a good blend of power and contact. Defensively, he's solid enough, and he's a pretty good athlete as well. His hometown New York Mets have the number one overall pick. Can they keep the Syracuse kid at home? It's also worth noting that Tommy Rogers is also from New York, so maybe there's a chance either one of those two guys would be willing to take less bonus money to go to their hometown team with the Mets. So those are the three guys at the top of the class who are certainly going to dictate how the first 10 or so picks go. Let's take a look at the rest of the class because there's plenty of depth at the other position players and I do want to keep my options open. If those three guys are all off the board at pick four or we just go in a different direction because we don't want to pay all that money, what are our other options? We'll start behind the plate at catcher and I think catcher is one of the very few positions in this class that I find to be pretty weak. We've done a lot of work on Eddie Pinto. He looks decent, could be a solid third round pick, but probably nothing earlier. And I don't really think there are many gems down the board. So we'll move over to first base, obviously headlined by Jeremy Franco. I think Juan Castillo could make it in the first round. After that though, the name to watch out for for me is a 21 year old college bat in Francisco Rodriguez. A switch hitter from the University of Maryland. Rodriguez is a guy who I think has a really high floor and for somebody projected to go in the fourth round, I think he's going to significantly outplay that projection. I think this is somebody who could be a bench bat at the least pretty early in his big league career, and one day could possibly become a starter. He's got really good contact, really good plate skills, and good enough power as well. There's a few intriguing players at second base, and that starts with Ray Sixto, a switch hitter from the Dominican Republic. Our scouts seem to be lower on him than MLB consensus, but I really like this prospect. I think he's got a ton of upside offensively. I think he's a really good athlete, solid defense. He's another smaller guy, 5'7", 188, but as a switch hitter and somebody who I think has a really high ceiling, he could be a good backup option for us at the fourth pick if we ultimately do not end up with one of the big guys. Luis Gonzalez, I think, could be a great pick for us in the second round. He's a really impressive athlete coming from Clemson. He's a lefty bat who hits for really good contact, really good plate skills. He's a little bit weak defensively, and I'm curious to see if he moves into an outfield role, being that he's a bigger guy, 6'4", 233 pounds. Maybe he moves to a corner spot in the outfield or maybe a corner infield spot, possibly first base. I think second base is one of the deepest positions in this class. Guys like Russ Casado, Cody Trevino, Curtis Scott, and Mark Wozleski are all names to watch out for. Third base is obviously highlighted by Caleb Mitchell. We haven't scouted Aaron Luke. That's because I don't really think he fits what we're looking for. He's a really similar player to Kyler Rodriguez, but without the injury stuff. So I feel like getting him would kind of be a redundant skill set. Tim Matsumoto is an intriguing player, but our scouts don't really seem to be high on him at all. 
And then I think the name to watch down the board is 21-year-old Eddie Duarte as we move over to short. There's a few guys who we're going to talk about over the next couple of minutes who I think are very big candidates for us with the fourth overall pick if we don't end up with one of the big three. And that starts with Pablo Rivera, the shortstop from Arkansas, who might be just as good of a prospect as those guys. He's going to be asking for pretty much just as much money. Rivera was probably the best player in college baseball this year, period. This home run against Kentucky went over the scoreboard at 478 feet. He's got an intriguing offensive skill set. Defensively, I think he's going to be able to stick it short. The one thing with him is that he's 23 years old. He's already on the older side, which could limit his upside. But I think the ceiling with him is still pretty high, and the floor is too. I don't think he's going to need to be in the minors for very long, if at all. So again, if we choose not to get one of the big guns or none of them fall, I think Rivera could be a very good fallback option as a guy who's probably going to be good enough to be a starter in the majors next year. I think in terms of depth, Guadalupe, Zambrano, and Elvis Morales are the names to watch as we move over to the outfield. Really good outfield crop, obviously starting with Tommy Rogers. I did not scout Daryl Wilson or Jackie Landry. The player profiles of guys whose potentials are pretty much equal to their overall rating scare me. Those players generally don't end up well. A guy who I do like down the board is Otis O'Neill, hailing from the Netherlands, currently playing at the University of Alabama. The 21-year-old O'Neill is a really intriguing player for me. He's another smaller guy, 5'9", 161. I imagine he's certainly going to need to grow into his frame, but I like what he provides offensively. Another guy who I don't think is going to have to be in the minors too long, and I think he has a good ceiling. Martin Erdman, I think, is the name down the board to watch in terms of depth as we move over to center field. If we do go for a cheaper option at pick four, I think it's going to be one of these two at the top, or maybe even three with Gomez. So we'll start with Stephen Quo, who, as I just said, is very much in play for the fourth overall pick. He's projected as a late first round guy, but I don't see it. I think this is one of the five to ten best players in this draft class at worst. And if we pick a guy like him, we're going to have so much more flexibility for the remaining rounds of the draft. Quo is a lefty bat who it's for good contact, good power, good athleticism, hails from China, moved over to the United States to play high school ball, where he was one of the best players in the country. Steven Tejada, hailing from Cuba, another guy who I think could be a big sleeper for pick four. He's not projected to go until the second round, but I don't listen to those projections because good players generally go a lot earlier than they're supposed to. And I think that could be the case with Steven Tejada, who has an even higher ceiling, in my opinion, than Quo. I think he's a little bit more raw, but I love his athleticism, his range, and his speed in center field. I think it might take a little longer for the bat to come along, but I think he has as much potential as those guys at the top of this class. And he's going to cost us a whole lot less money and give us a lot more flexibility for the rest of our draft. Greg Gomez is another guy I would keep my eye on. I don't think he has the ceiling as those other two center fielders, Quo or Tejada. So because of that, I don't think he'd be in play for the fourth pick. But I think he's a lot more ready to go than both of them. And is another guy who I don't think is going to need to be in the minors for too long. Playing at Georgia Tech, Gomez has been one of the best players in the country this year. Great contact. The power has really improved. Good plate skills and good range in the outfield. Handling from Puerto Rico, I think his lefty bat will make a big impact for whoever drafts him pretty early on. I like the depth here. Guys like Silas Yeager and Danny Denny are names to watch. And then at right field, I don't think there's as much talent here. Mark Whitehead and Blake Botts are the two names down the board who I would keep my eye on. And that does it for the position players in this year's class. Let me know in the comments what you think we should do with the fourth pick. If one of the top three guys fall, should we draft them? Just focus on value and worry about the money later. Or should we go for somebody who's a lot cheaper, such as some of those center fielders, Stephen Quo, Stephen Tejada, maybe even Greg Gomez. So that'll wrap up the episode. Next time around is the 2025 MLB Draft, which again will be premiering this weekend. More information coming soon on the Community tab. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out.